Hello and welcome to today's ACM6 Soft webinar. This webcast is part of ACM6 Soft's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM6 Soft webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Alexander Serebrenik, Associate Professor of Software Evolution at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we get started, uh, I would like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R on Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile devices. You can always cl close and relaunch your presentation. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. At the end, the presentation will have time to respond to the questions. The session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when the archive becomes available. Today's presentation is Gender Inclusivity Software Engineering by Margaret Burnett and Anita Sarma. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Margaret and Anita. Margaret Burnett is a distinguished professor at Oregon State University. She began her career in industry where she was the first woman software developer ever hired at Procter & Gamble Ivory Dale. A few degrees and startups later, she joined academia with a research focus on people who are engaged in some form of software development. She leads the teams that created Gender Mag, a software inspection process that uncovers gender inclusiveness issues in software, from spreadsheets to programming environments. Margaret Burnett is an ACM Fellow, a member of the ACM CHI Academy, and a member of the Academic Alliance Advisory Board of the National Center for Women in Technology. NCWIT. Our second speaker today is Dr. Anita Sarma, who is an associate professor at Oregon State University. She performed her PhD work at the University of California, Irvine, and was a postdoctoral scholar at Carnegie Mellon University. Sarma's research cross cuts software engineering and human computer interaction and explores how social technical dependencies affect teamwork, how onboarding barriers in open source can be alleviated and how software can be made gender inclusive. She leads the Gender Mag work investigating gender biases in open source software communities, tools, and infrastructure, and how to remove such biases. Her work has been funded through a variety of NSF and US Air Force grants, including the prestigious NSF Career Award. Margaret, Anita, without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Alexander, and welcome to everyone. Today we're going to talk about something we call gender inclusivity software engineering. So first we should talk about, well, gender and software, how did they relate? And the answer is most software has gender bias bugs in it. So here's a worried software developer uh, imagining more work on his already full plate, and he's going, you're kidding, where? And the answer is, in most of the software that, that he creates and everyone creates, and not only that, in the tools you all use to do that creation. So here we still have a worried software developer thinking about his workload, and he says, how much does this really matter? And the answer is, it matters a lot. Because when those biases are present, it's like a cognitive tax being added to, to every single interaction that, that your users, your software's users, um, encounter every time you hit one of the bugs. But there's even another reason to be caring about this, and that is that if we take down those gender biases, we not only are removing that, that cognitive 
tax, we're also just making our software better. And that's because something that uh, is, is quite well established now is that when we address an underserved population in our technology, it turns out to help everyone, not just the underserved population. And so the, the best example of all, perhaps, is curb cuts, you know, those cut out places in the sidewalk. Not exactly high tech, but it's still a great example. So way back in the day, there were no curb cuts, and somebody noticed somebody in a wheelchair like this experiencing uh, the, the barriers to using sidewalks, and they said, wow, this is terrible. We should do something about this, and curb cuts were born. And they did help people in wheelchairs. And they helped people with those wheeled strollers, too, or uh, walkers, too. And, <laughs> speaking of strollers, they also helped people pushing strollers. And they helped people on bicycles. And they helped people pushing heavy bales of hay with their wheeled dollies. And they helped the few people in the world that have those suitcases with wheels. Surely you've seen them. So by taking down these barriers for one underserved population, what we ended up with were better sidewalks for everyone. So hopefully I have you inspired to try to think about, well, what do we need to do in our software engineering activities to deal with this? But first, I want to tell you what not to do. Shrink it and pink it. Do not do this. This is not a good strategy. Here's, here are a few examples from people who have tried it this way. Dell's pink laptops, circa 2009. So back then, Dell decided that they would like to get some, some money by selling laptops to women uh, in addition to the ones they were already selling to men. So they had this brainy idea of, I have a great idea, let's paint it pink. And, and we'll come up with a website, too, with recipes and stuff. You know, women will surely like that. Well, <laughs> Yeah, this didn't uh, go over very well. This was before the days of Twitter, but even so, the outcry was so great, so fast, that it took Dell only 20 minutes to take down that website, 20 minutes from the time they released it. So that gives you some idea about how well that one went over. Then there's Bic for her. Bic also decided that they'd like to get more sales to women, and so they had a brainy idea of coming up with pink and purple pens and adding sparkles and a label for her and raising the price. So this went over like a lead balloon as well. Uh, there were blogs and outcries all over the place. Perhaps the most famous one is the one by Ellen, the talk show host, who, uh, who started out her blog saying, oh, my feeble hand. Before Bic for her, I couldn't write my own things. I had to go to some big, strong man. But now, okay, so bad idea. Please, if anybody says, well, what should we do, paint it pink, the answer is no. And here's why. It's because nobody's typical. The world doesn't divide into typical men and women. So, so we, can't, we can't even think about dividing people into piles. Instead, we have to think about debugging because dividing is never going to work. So how do you do that? Well, funny you should ask, <laughs> the gender mag <laughs> method, which uh, Anita and I have been working on for quite a while now, along with several other collaborators. So gender mag stands for gender inclusiveness magnifier, and it is a method, uh, a process, to evaluate your own software's inclusiveness. The scope is problem solving. So whenever uh, the intended user is sitting in front of the computer with some, some kind of problem they're trying to solve, so uh, then this is the right moment for gender mag. So for example, uh, if they are a software developer and they've decided they need to debug, then that's a problem they've brought to the computer and they're going to use debugging tools, uh, debugging software to help them do it. So that's the right moment when they're working on a spreadsheet, when they're working on trying to make decisions, uh, with decision support software, when they're working on security se uh, settings, all of these things, they're scratching their head and thinking. But it turns out uh, that we've discovered over time that it doesn't even have to be a situation where somebody brought a problem to the computer that they needed to solve, because the computer introduces enough problems <laughs> in so many cases, because the interfaces are often completely obtuse. 
So we've found that gender mag works for almost anything because of that latter situation. So what gender mag centers around is five cognitive facets. So the things that we'll be talking about today are going to be the ways that people go about solving problems. And these get brought to life in four personas that are part of our method, Abby, Tim, and the Pats, and you'll be briefly meeting Abby shortly. Um, so besides the, the cognitive facets and the personas that are built out of them, then um, it's all set to a process using what we what, what the gender specialized um, device called a cognitive walkthrough, which is a long-standing inspection method from HCI. And the way we've specialized it is to embed the facets and the personas into that process. So let's see how it works. You start by picking one of the personas. I pick Abby. Done. Then, in the, the tool or the software that you're trying to evaluate, you pick a scenario. In this case, what we have is um, what we have is an augmented physical bookstore, and um, you can think of this as like a Google Map for inside a bookstore. And um, the scenario that they've chosen is find science fiction books. So that's what they want Abby uh, to to try to accomplish. And then what we do is we walk through this scenario, we being the developers who are trying to evaluate this, uh, with the idea of the sub-goals and actions they were hoping their user would do, like this. So we start by turning to the developers and saying, so what were you hoping Abby would want to want to do first in her head? And they were saying, we want Abby to want to see a map. So that's the thought they were hoping was in her head. And then, as evaluators, all you do is ask, well, will Abby have this sub-goal? And everybody who's doing the evaluating uh, provides their answers. Some might say yes, some might say no, some might be maybe. You just write it all down uh, because we're trying to harvest everybody's idea about whether she will. The important thing, though, is why. And so to understand the why, we need to turn to the details of Abby and her cognitive styles, uh, which we'll see shortly. So we write that all down. Then we, we push that thought into her head, because Abby is a persona, which is just a fake user. And so um, it's possible for us to push thoughts into her head. She's fake. Anyway, so then we turn to the developers again and say, if somebody had that goal, what do you want them to click first? And the developer says, I want them to click Browse Off. OK, this may seem a little lame to you. It did to me as well. Uh, but this was a very early prototype that some people were doing. And that's what they had in mind. So that's what we evaluate. So then we ask again, will Abby do this? Yes, no, maybe, and why? And we again refer to her personas and write down everything. Then we make her do it, look at the feedback, which isn't shown on this screen and then say, if she sees the feedback, will she see that she's making progress? Yes, no, maybe, and why? And that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, and you just continue until the end of the scenario. So now you know how it works. Uh, oh, here's what one, uh, one developer said. They said, well, Abby's not going to push that because it's not her style to push and poke. So that's one example of one of the why reasons which he got out of her persona. So what are these personas? Well, each one, as I've mentioned, is a fake user. And each one represents a, a pile of users, uh, a range of them, but only from the perspective of these five cognitive facets. Everything else, the background and so on and so forth, is customizable. So these five cognitive facets are their motivations for using the software. So why are they sitting in front of the chair in, the first, in front of the system in the first place? Their information processing style their computer self-efficacy, their risk averseness in using technology, and their learning style and learning technology. So let's take a look at Abby and, and see what these look like. But first, don't try to read it. It's teeny little print. The only thing I want you to notice so far is this line, this horizontal line that I've just added, which uh, cuts the persona in half. The top half is entirely customizable. This is where you put the, the background, the education, the age, the job title, um, the picture, um, uh, which as you can see can be any age, any ethnicity, even any gender. 
Um, and so this is, this is where you put kind of the demographic things about your target audience. So if, um, if the software you're evaluating is stuff for chemists, then Abby would be a chemist. And if it's uh, word processing stuff, maybe Abby would be a secretary, whatever. Um, the bottom half, though, you can't touch. Those are Abby's cognitive styles. So let's look at one of those, her attitude toward risk. So Abby rarely has spare time. She's a very busy person. So she's risk averse about using unfamiliar technologies. That doesn't mean she's technophobic. She just doesn't like going off exploring new ones because she doesn't have the time. So let's look at some of the foundational data behind this risk facet. Um, all of these cognitive facets are backed by at least five independent empirical studies. Um, and I'm not showing you five. I'm only showing you one. This is a fairly recent one. First thing to notice is look how similar the two genders in this graph, the, the men and the women, are. Okay, There's just a ton of overlap, which is another way of saying you can't divide people into piles because there's just way too much overlap. Second thing to notice, though, is that the statistical distributions are very different. So this is why when we talk about cognitive biases, we're also talking about gender biases. Now, the, uh, the job of Tim, that one of our personas, is to look out for all of the interests of those people over on the Tim side of the graph. So regardless of their gender, Tim is looking out for risk-tolerant people with technology. And Abby's job is to look out for risk-averse people with technology. And the path's job is to pick up the middle. So now I've added a horizontal line separating the Tim side of the graph from everybody else. So suppose, hypothetically, that you had software that only worked for the Tim side of the graph. Well, usually that is what you have. In any case, in that situation, for this population, what we would see is that um, the software would serve about half the men reasonably well, the ones over on the Tim side, and only a quarter of the women. This is why cognitive biases also turn out to be gender biases. Now, these facets aren't quite as static as we've talked about them so far. Not only do they depend on different individuals, they also depend on different situations. So they can, one individual can move around in these, which is another reason why it's important to support all of them. So let's just start by looking at the very top one. Abby, um, besides being risk averse, has an information processing style that can be described as very bursty. So when she's problem solving and, and feels like she needs more information, she likes to gather a lot of it. Uh, so that she can get her head all the way around a problem before she has to start trying to take action forward. And then when she does take action forward, she makes very few mistakes. Anita, on the other hand, right, I'm not very much like Abby in some cases, for example, the information processing style. I just do not and cannot read long stuff, so I need bulleted email lists, otherwise I just can't read it, right? But in the second case, in computer self-efficacy, I'm pretty much spot on with Abby. Attitude towards risk, I'm in the middle. It's very situational, so more like the paths. But when exploding and tinkering, that is, whether I need a tutorial or I'll just go push and prod on buttons, I'm more like pushing and prodding on buttons to learn about what this is about. So this is, again, every individual is different, and the cognitive facets kind of can be situational or depending on the specific individuals. So what do these facets actually mean for software engineering? To understand more about that, we conducted some field studies. And in one of the field studies, these are with open source teams looking at their own project. One of the teams found out that a problem that Abby would face uh, if she was a newcomer to an open source project, she has all the technical background, but has not contributed to open source projects before. In such a situation, in this particular project that the teams were looking at, they found that the pull request policy, what is it about, comes too late in the process. It is only shown when the contributor, for example, Abby, would actually open a, open a new pull request. Other than, other than that, there was never any information about it. So it's coming too late. And remember, Abby is someone who would not like to push and prod and find out about it. 
Here is some more data from one of our field studies. This was done with five open source teams. They were all looking at their own software projects and running the gender MAC evaluations. For all the use cases or scenarios that they evaluated, they found problems. We have categorized them based on the newcomer barrier categories by Steinmacher et al. And all the categories that were relevant in these use cases, our uh, evaluators found problems. But more importantly, if you look at the right-hand column, a large majority of these issues were associated with Abby's cognitive style. So if Abby, it was not just hard for Abby as a newcomer to get into the open source project, but her cognitive facets were not supported by these tools and technology, and therefore it would cause like a glass floor even for Abby's to come to uh, open source. So this data was pretty eye-opening, and it's like, wow, open source tools and technology are embedding these gender biases, which might be causing uh, diversity issues. But we were asking ourselves, okay, this was from the perspective of the software designers evaluating their tool. What actually happens on the ground? What do newcomers actually face? To look at that, we did some diary studies. We looked at the diaries that students wrote as part of their open source uh, course where over a semester-long project, they had to make a final contribution at the end of the class. And they wrote down things they faced problems, things that worked out. We analyzed the data to identify what kind of barriers they faced and how much of those barriers had any facets included. And of course, we found that more women than men reported barriers. It was significantly different. And more women than men had cognitive bias or facets associated with those barriers. So there was a difference, and newcomers who are with Abby's uh, cognitive styles are facing problems. We also triangulated our data with prior empirical work on newcomer uh, orientation problems, barriers, as well as with cognitive facets from other gender mag work. This data is also triangulated from theoretical models and frameworks. What this really says is it is no longer a a uh, surprise that there is diversity issues in open source, but what we are finding is many of these diversity issues might be actually coming from the tools and technology themselves. So what are some of the other places where gender biases have been reported? Unlevel playing fields. We have talked about open source projects, but also programming environments, spreadsheets, e-learning tools, robots, mobile apps, health systems, websites, and even digital libraries. So a whole set of other uh, technological fields, anything with technology, there is an unlevel playing field. Here is data from 17 teams that have done gender mag, and the blue bars over here present the percentage of inclusivity issues found for the features that were evaluated. On an average, we find 32% of the features that teams evaluated, they found gender biases or inclusivity issues. On the leftmost side, we have the shortest bar, which is 12%, which is not bad. This is the best, most inclusive software, but they still have problems. And on the uh, rightmost side, we have 100%. Every feature that the team evaluated, they found a problem. Now, this is really bad, but it's actually good because this team looked at uh, the gender mag evaluation using paper prototypes. So we're easily able to fix it and move forward. Hopefully by now we have convinced you that um, gender biases because of tools are a concern. And now you might be asking yourself, oh, I like this. So how can I integrate gender map into my own software development process? So to help you with that. As we have been working with the teams that we collaborate, collaborate with, we have been uh, finding out, harvesting the practices that these teams have been doing to make gender mag work for their teams. And here we are going to talk about six such practices. The first practice is gender mag early. That's a little computer coming out of an egg, if it's not clear. It's really cute, we like it. Uh, but gender magging early means the earlier you get your evaluation done for inclusivity, as well as other usability studies you're doing, right at the paper prototype stage, earlier you can find the problem and fix it. Remember that big blue bar with 100%? That was a good thing because they evaluated the paper prototype and they were able to fix much quicker. 
Next thing is invite Abby to the office. What this is really is, you know, out of sight becomes out of mind. So these teams have been trying to keep Abby front and center, like keeping the persona nearby, either a picture on the desk, posters, slide presentations. One of the teams actually had name tags saying, hi, I am Abby, for teams that were doing designing or teams that were having requirements. So the idea was just having someone reminded of Abby would help them think about and channel Abby as they're doing the designing, you know, pick widget A, widget B, what would Abby do? And that just helps you think about the inclusivity issue. Next is debriefing. This is a really simple thing, but the teams, all the teams really found it helpful right at the end of the gender max session when things are still fresh in their mind to talk amongst themselves and everybody is there in the room. Uh, how to uh, address those inclusivity issues, what should they do about it. And one way that people have worked is categorizing these issues based on how easy will it be to fix, what part of the software it affects, just making these categories that then they can prioritize and uh, move forward. Another, part of, another practice was evaluating UI patterns. Oftentimes in software we have similar UI templates or uh, interaction paradigms that are common, identifying these patterns and then fixing them gives you the bigger bang for the buck. The final one we are going to talk about is the facets drive fixing. So we talked about these five facets. So as a team, you can pick up one facet, say information processing style, and then make the fixes to uh, help with that inclusivity issues. This helps you prioritize which facets are important for your team and your software, and again, helps you prioritize and streamline your fixing. So what were some of these fixes like in actual concrete terms? So remember the problem we talked about in the uh, open source um, field study that the pull request guidelines came much later in the process while someone had to actually open the pull request? This is actually um, changes that GitHub has made providing earlier entry points to the contributing guidelines. These little boxes come up right when you are at the pull request uh, tab or the issue tab, and it tells you where to go for getting more information about the contributing guidelines. It's easy for uh, newcomers like Abby who wants more information, but it's also very easy to dismiss for experts or for the team. Another example that we found uh, that the team, this is uh, Wiki Education Dashboard, they had the contributing guidelines, but they also wanted to make the contribution guidelines much more process-oriented and simpler. So right in their uh, contributing MD, what they have is, what is the steps required before someone opens a pull request? What is the actual pull request format? What do they need to do after they have opened the pull request? Right up front, so people like Abby would know what to do. And again, this can be ignored by experts or tests. The final example that the team came up with was structuring their pull request template so it was simple and clean. It had these resources that if Abby wanted, she could open the link and keep it in front of her as she's making her pull request, uh, finalize, finalizing that. But again, Tim's then would not have to read so much. So this is one example of a fix that actually helps people with Abby's information processing style because she can get all the information, keep it in front of her, and it helps them. They are not getting bogged down or overwhelmed with too much information. So, do these fixes actually work? Well, we were lucky enough to get some data from Microsoft Academic about some fixes that they made to one of their systems to make it inclusive for everybody. So what they did is they started with their original production system, which had been out there in the world for a while, and then they used, did a gender mag evaluation and made some fixes that jumped off of the facets of the sort that Anita just explained to you, and then they measured how well people did in the old system versus the new system. So as you can see from this scary looking graph, um, the, uh, these, these, by the way, show failure rates per person. In the original system, women failed the empirical task more than twice as often as men. But after they made the gender mag fixes, the gender gap completely disappeared and everybody got better. Which is yet another reason to say you just can't divide people into piles. And in fact, gender mag is 
all about inclusivity, not about trading off one population for another or coming up with different interfaces. It's all about inclusivity. So calls to action, what can you do? Well, if you're in industry or in the classroom, you can train or teach Gender Mag. All the resources and everything are free. Um, and in fact, this is fairly new work. Um, we're, we've been doing some Gender Mag education research. And we've found that teaching Gender Mag in classes is an easy fit to software engineering classes, HCI classes, web design classes, any kind of design class, game design. Um, uh, it's an easy fit. There are resources available to anyone, all free, uh, at gendermag.org. And this is a community effort, not an us effort. So what we're hoping is that everybody will help make it better. So we have this community wiki um, this, uh, that, which shows the resources that are available for people who want to teach it or train it. You can see there are some lecture slides and in-class activities and handouts and homeworks and stuff like that. And some of these we invented. But some of them came directly from the community that are trying to make use of them and coming up with better ones and new ones and so on and so forth. So if you decide to engage in this, I do hope you'll give stuff back because this is a, a community, not, a, not an us thing. Just to give some ideas, this is a fairly recent screenshot of the various places that have started teaching it. These are, these are academic institutions. Um, and it's pretty cool because we've only had this Gender Mag Teach project going on for a little over a year, but already uh, our list is up to 20 people that we know about, so that's pretty awesome. Um, the other way that Gender Mag has been coming to academia is to think about the software that, that academia produces and uses to do the business of academics. So uh, there are class registration systems and admission applications and bias reporting systems and IT support web pages. And all of these have just as many of these cognitive biases, which are also gender biases, um, embedded in them as, as do industrial products. So it's time to clean up our own houses. Um, our University of Oregon State's already uh, been starting this. We've been working on a pilot for about a year now, and other universities are starting to do it too. So this, uh, if you have influence in your university's IT endeavors, um, then I hope you'll get them interested in also trying to get the gender biases out of their software. Uh, more calls to action besides teaching it and training it. Of course, you can be using it on the software you build. That's why it's called Gender Inclusivity Software Engineering, using the practices that, that we've been talking about in this talk. If you are an open source fan uh, or a participant, we've been building a tool that helps to semi-automate the process. And by semi, we mean very semi. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, um, it's part of trying to streamline the process streamline the process for busy software developers. And if you want to, you could help make it better, which would be awesome, because it needs it. <laughs> and if you're a researcher, then you can apply it, you can extend it, you can blend it, you can study it, you can automate it, no doubt leading to best paper awards. Ha. Mm -hmm. And you can help us with uh, the emerging best practices. So you've seen a few of the practices that we've started to harvest from various people who are using it on the ground. Um, uh, it would be awesome to have other people doing this work too. So I hope you'll join us in this, in this endeavor. So in conclusion, debiasing software, debiasing your software tools pays off. It pays off in business, in the bottom line, in the size of the market, in the classroom, in making your own software and tools better, and of course, in society. Here's a, here are a couple of quotes from people in industry who used it. One person said, it gave me a way to think, to address issues that will benefit everyone, but especially women. And somebody else said, it changed the way I think. So here's a slide with some resources. Uh, of course, everything's free. We're academics. Um, and um, so I'll leave this slide up for a few minutes, and then go back to the conclusion one to uh, give us some fodder for questions. And I think we'll turn it over to you, Alex, for the questions. Mm -hmm. 
thank you very much, Margaret and Anita. I uh, really enjoyed your uh, present double presentation, and uh, we got quite some number of questions. Uh, so let us take a closer look at some of them. So one of the uh, questions which uh, has been raised uh, is whether by considering a gender persona, we are not just dividing people into the very same buckets you are objecting against. Uh, the question would be then whether uh, one could make the product work for the largest proportion of people regardless of gender or regardless of uh, any other kind of uh, demographics. The question whether we actually need this kind of subdivision. Okay, so it's a great question. Um, it's um, for, for those who, who are concerned about the idea of thinking about it in terms of gender, you don't actually have to. You can think about it in terms of cognitive style and it'll get you just as far. Um, but we picked those cognitive styles those particular five ways of looking at cognitive style because they are the most firmly established of having gender differences in the literature from education, psychology, that sort of thing. So um, it is, shall we say, the five cognitive styles that are the most pertinent uh, if what you want to also be is gender inclusive. So that's, that's one answer to your question. Another answer to your question is because um, people's cognitive facets vary from one moment to the next, we actually can't divide people into piles by gender, even if we really wanted to, because uh, their cognitive styles change so much depending on one situation uh, or another. So I guess the bottom line for that questioner is it isn't about gender and it is about gender. And uh, let me add one thing. So the reason we actually have those personas is because having a persona is, it makes uh, designers or software developers uh, kind of personalize and empathize with that particular persona. There is research that shows how uh, putting a picture and having kind of background and skills helps people kind of understand that particular persona's mindset. And the reason we have Abby persona and Tim is kind of those are the extremes of these five uh, cognitive styles. So as a team, you can do either take Tim's persona and see that all those facets are actually uh, supported, and the facets at the other end of the spectrum are supported. And we have this picture where, um, let me see if I can get over here, push to audience. This is what, what Gender Mag is all about. So even though Abby is on one side of the spectrum and Tim is on the other, if you support both sides, then everyone in between are supported, and that's what Gender Mag hopes to achieve. Yes, and, and you'll also notice on this slide that we're showing that Abby can have any picture and so can Tim and even any gender. So the important thing really is the cognitive styles and if somebody is worried about seeming to stereotype in some way, they can always have both pictures be men or both pictures be women uh, and as long as they're paying attention to the cognitive styles, they'll still get just as far with it. So thank you very much for your answers. Would it also mean that in, uh, instead of talking about gender, we could uh, the same uh, gender mark-like technique can be applied to study ethnicity or race or disability or younger developers as opposed to older developers and so on? Um, yes and no. Um, gender mag, because it's all about cognition, definitely will do no harm if you apply it to those other populations. But as I mentioned before, we did pick those five facets out of all of the ones we could have picked because they were the most strongly implicated for, um, for removing gender biases in software. So let's say, for example, we wanted to consider um, age instead of gender. There we would probably really need a cognitive facet about memory, but we don't have it in gender mag because it's not implicated in, in the way people solve problems uh, from a gender perspective. So um, we have a parent method that we've been working on, which is called inclusive mag, and uh, it's kind of a meta method. It's, it's the one that was used to generate gender mag, and you could use the same one to generate um, the, the sort of exactly the right set of facets for different ways of looking at the population. So it's kind of a yes and no. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. 
Um, of course, as software engineers, we like tools, and in particular, we like automatic, uh, to, to automate everything we can. So the question is, of course, can you briefly describe which part of the approach can be automated in the tool you are building and which part cannot be? Yes. <laughs> well, um, in the tool we're building, it's fairly unambitious. Um, the tool that we have, which is called the Gender Magnet Recorder's Assistant, it's just a recorder's assistant. It's sort of a note-taking tool that's integrated with the prototype and the evaluation step. So it's not doing much heavy lifting. It's just sort of um, taking care of some of the clerical tasks. Um, is it possible to go farther? I'm pretty sure it is, um, but hard work. And what I hope is that people in the community will start thinking about that and try to figure out ways to automate more aspects of it. I Actually, I don't know if that was what, uh, Alexander, you asked. I was thinking, Alexander was asking, how can we automate putting inclusivity inside the tools we develop? Was that the question? Well, I've been more or less thinking about the uh, analysis, right? So because of the gender mag is, of course, a cognitive workflow mechanism, uh, mm -hmm. it's an essentially a manual process. You look and you try to understand whether the questions should be answered as yes, as no, or as may be. To what extent can some of those things be automated? Right. So some that, was, of those that was the thing I... Okay, that was the thing you had... Yeah, that was right, that was Margaret's answer, answer right. Okay. Right. It's right. A, let's just say it's an open question, and I think it would be awesome if people would start working on it. Right. So there is the example of COG tool, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that came out of, I guess, IBM? Uh, and Carnegie John, Mellon. And Carnegie yeah. Mellon and IBM, yeah. So they, they were trying to have a tool that did... a semi-automation of the cognitive walkthrough. Um, so it, was not, it cannot be fully automated, but that is something that if someone is interested, they could look at. All right, all right. Can you please elaborate more on specific inclusivity bugs you have discovered in open source? Because, I mean, you mentioned how many of them were there, but what are the most painful ones or the most obvious ones or less obvious ones? So the most obvious one, actually, uh, from uh, what we have looked at, um, well, three things. The first one was if it's a complete newcomer, even finding what issue or what task to work on is completely unobvious. Um, oftentimes, the readmes are talking a lot about how to set up uh, the, uh, the system, how to use things, but not about what kind of issues there are, what kind of um, task is even possible. Uh, some projects are doing uh, la uh, tags and labels that help, but many of them do not. So a newcomer coming to an open source project is like completely new hostile environment and they have to just find their way out to what can be done. So unclear uh, information about what types of issues exist and how to even start working on that was a big one. Another uh, project had a couple of those, them look at now contributing license agreement and it's kind of jargony, and people just expect to know what these CLAs are and how to deal with it. But for a newcomer and who has not looked at it, it can be kind of um, uh, overwhelming and intimidating. So an unclear information in the README and the contributing MD was one of the main things. And some of the problems are also because of the way GitHub is actually structured. For example, the pull request process is not clear. And a lot of the teams felt like that they are handicapped or, you know, they have to work around the GitHub structure. So what they could do is trying to make the process much more clearer through their documentation. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, several participants remarked that uh, essentially gender mag is about cognitive style. And by labeling it as gender max, essentially about putting stress on gender, uh, the, uh, this technique might repel some software developers because, of course, gender is a hot and uh, politically charged topic. Would you consider renaming the approach? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have a parent method called Inclusive Mag, and so people who are afraid of the name or, or just uncomfortable with it can always use that name uh, because it is, after all, the name of the whole family, and then go forward uh, using that, that naming. 
um, we, we need to stick with the name Gender Mag to make clear um, that the cognitive styles that we've picked are the ones most implicated if what you want is gender inclusivity. But there could also be an age mag and a, um, a vision mag and, and you know, other ways of considering populations. And, and all of those fit under the umbrella of inclusive mag. And in all of those cases, some of the cognitive facets will be different because some of them will be more implicated in, uh, in, in those ways of thinking about the population. So speaking about, speak, thinking about population, can you elaborate more on uh, cognitive or learning theories or models which you have used in order to arrive to those characteristics, and how did you ensure that they are the appropriate ones and okay, that it doesn't question. have been missed? Yeah, great question. Uh, first of all, definitely some have been missed um, on purpose because one of our goals was to keep the method feasible for busy software engineers. And so what we didn't want was, you know, 14 different facets because it would just be too hard to keep all of that in mind. And so um, uh, it all started with, goodness, um, over 10 years of foundational research. So my, my first PhD student who was in this space was Laura Beckwith, and she started by reading from at least five different fields about gender differences in pr that related to problem solving. So she was reading from psychology and education and feminist literature and um, uh, gaming literature and all kinds of stuff, and uh, there were there was just a ton of foundational um, evidence about people gravitating more toward one st style or another um, that that were clustering by gender. And I need to stress, all of this is about individual differences, not um, not a way of dividing the population. Because as you saw in the risk slide, there's a huge amount of overlap. Uh, both uh, between uh, those the two genders that were in that graph, and also a great amount of variation within any one gender. But still, uh, if we ignore particular fa cognitive facets, mostly the ones that have been ignored historically in the creation of software, then many of the people that we're excluding happen to be women. In any case, um, so from from that initial set of research, which went on for quite a while. Uh, we took some hypotheses into the labs and looked to see whether we were seeing them pan out exactly the way that the psychologists and the education researchers and, and so on had, had found them in other settings. And sure enough, we found them in our settings too. And so, um, so in, selecting, in selecting downward, in filtering to a feasible number of facets, we used three criteria. The first one was each, each of these cognitive facets had to be independently substantiated by at least five independent empirical works. And so um, most of these were by other people, but we did some of it ourselves as well. So that was one criteria, and if it didn't meet that, we didn't include it because we needed it to be very well established. Uh, second, it had to have obvious, obvious implications for software. So if it was really difficult to figure out how to apply it to software, then we, we decided it wouldn't be practical for software engineers, so we would exclude it on that basis. Um, let's see, what was the third one? Oh, I've forgotten. There was a third criterion. <laughs> let's see, needed to make sense, needed to be firmly established. I've forgotten the third one. <laughs> anyway, there were three. Um, the, uh, the Gender Bank Journal paper that came out in 2016 in uh, interacting with computers has the third one in there as well. Um, okay. Thanks, uh, so, wait. Let me. Uh, I'm not. I. I, uh, I have another thought. Um, some Great. Of the <laughs> some of the participants also may be concerned uh, that that using this method might promote stereotyping. Mm -hmm. So we did a paper to investigate that. We had an awesome collaborator with that, Nicola Marsden, who is not only. Um, a uh, computer scientist with eye tracking expertise, but also a specialist in stereotyping. And so what we found is that using the gender mag method in, basically in any of its forms um, is associated with less gender stereotyping than people just regularly do. 
and that the newest version of GenderMag, the one with the multiple pictures uh, that I, you know, is extremely customizable, um, is uh, the best of, of all of the previous renditions as well. So that's, um, that's our paper that showed up in CHI-17 for, mm -hmm. for people who would like to take a look at that. Um, yeah, you can, uh, you can go there. Uh, the, it has the word stereotyping in the title. Nice. Thank you very, very much. So, of course, Gender Mag focuses on uh, cognitive aspects, but those that are reflected in differences between two traditional genders. But, of course, there is a substantial part of population, in particular social development population, that does not identify as any of those two. So the question would be, how does gender mag reflect on uh, non-binary individuals and whether uh, they are explicitly included in the model, excluded in the model, or should the model be adapted in some ways? Okay, that's another great question. Um, thank you to the, to the questioner who asked it. Um, so um, in one way, but one of one of the people who uses gender mag uh, put it this way. Uh, what he said was, "Well, um, gender, as it pertains to software itself, is is actually binary. There are the the educated white men who have been served in the past, and then there's everybody else who <laughs> mostly hasn't been served. Um, and this is, of course, because of the historical beginnings of of sort of how our software in industry has built up." Um, so that's, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is, although um, Abby was devised to have uh, facets that are very common, cognitive facets that are very common about, uh, among women, um, Abby herself does not need to be a woman. And we have a, a tool separate from the one we talked about before that allows you to customize Abby in any way you want. So not only can you make her a man, you can also use whatever pronoun you wish, so she doesn't have to be a binary gender at all. You can make her anything, uh, and the same is true of Tim and the Pats. Um, so, so there's really no particular reason why you have to choose one of the binary traditional genders. And, and the other point about that is the reason that we included the Pats as identical twins was to try to make a statement as well that um, the, the gender is not the determiner, really. The, the determiner is all about cognitive styles. So I would like to add to that, like in the uh, personas that we have, the background, the skill set is all customizable. And that's where you can bring the persona to life with the picture you care about, the pronouns you care about, and give life to the persona that uh -huh. you feel is the right uh, individual that you want to um, look out for. Right. Any, as, mm -hmm. any gender will work. And any gender would work. It's the five facets that really matter. Great. Uh, another question comes from Brazil, and uh, the participant wonders whether um, some of those facets uh, can be linked to confusion as experienced by participants. Would it be, for instance, the case for computer self-efficacy? Um, let's see if I understand the uh, question. Um, I don't. <laughs> could, you, could you phrase it a different way? Sure. Um, when developers perform their daily tasks, they sometimes experience confusion. Uh, the question here, given uh, that computer self-efficacy or eventually other facets are related to um, the structure of gender mag, the question is whether gender mag can be used to identify situations when individuals experience confusion. Ah, I see. Um, so um, it's a great question. Uh, anybody can experience confusion if the software is bad enough, and there's, <laughs> there's plenty of software that's bad enough. Um, so you don't need to have lower computer self-efficacy in order to run into that. Um, Gender Mag and, and the other children of Inclusive Mag can, uh, can detect usability bugs that would affect anyone uh, in addition to the ones that are particularly um, uh, going to trouble, uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of be biased against particular segments of the population. So, um, and, and the reason that it can find 
um, sort of generic usability bugs like the font is too small or you know who can see this color or whatever is because um, we've inherited some of the nice characteristics of the cognitive walkthrough that we borrowed to add the specializations. So uh, when there's no particular facet involved, like let's say it doesn't have to do with, with self-efficacy, it doesn't have to do with anything, it's just confusing, then you've found something, and it's not a bias, but it's still something to fix because it's just making the software worse for everyone. Um, I have, let, me, let me answer that a little differently. I have a little different take on it. From the field studies and open source uh, projects we have looked at, um, many times the confusion came because lack of uh, clarity of what the process was. They come in, there's no clear instructions, there's no clear documentation, people are confused. Uh, so information processing style and the learning by process or just tinkering and just stick here, click here, click here, figure it out. I think those two facets are, in my mind, what I've seen, the ones that closely cause people to get confused because the software is structured in a not clear way. So that's, I think, where the confusion rises. And where self-efficacy can play a role is uh, people with low computer self-efficacy tend to blame themselves and quit versus uh, people with high self-efficacy just blame, oh, it's a dumb computer. They don't know what they're doing. And that's the outcome of this bad um, information uh, providing and uh, providing tutorials or help leads to people with low self-efficacy actually hurting themselves and blaming themselves and maybe quitting. So I won't say like self-efficacy causes confusion, but the confusion that is caused by bad design of software can impact people with low self-efficacy more. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, there is uh, another question which is essentially about the application domain of gender mag. Whether gender mag is a way to strictly design user interfaces or whether it can be applied for software development as a whole? Um, it's, about, it's all about workflows. So it's bigger than just you know, widgets on a user interface. But because it's about people problem solving, then for it to be in scope, somebody needs to be sitting in front of it trying to problem solve. So I really think of it as more about the workflow that the software enforces rather than only the user interface. Right. The other thing we are right now looking at and very excited about the results is how the information architecture, um, you know, that's just how information presented, documentation, just your software, just the information architecture of the system, that can also have um, implications for the cognitive facets. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, dear participants, I would like to thank you for the question, um, but I'm afraid we have run out of time. Uh, I obviously hope that uh, the uh, discussion of uh, gender mag has inspired you and maybe converted you to try and apply it in your work or in your teaching. Um, I also would like to uh, especially thank um, our unsung hero, the producer, Vernera Arnaudova, for organizing this. As you know, this webinar was recorded, and it will be available online in a few days. You will uh, receive an email when it becomes available. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities uh, at uh, learning.acm.org and www.sigsoft.org special interest group on software engineering, SIGSOFT. On behalf of SIGSOFT, the speakers and myself, I would like to thank you again for joining us, and I hope that you will join us again in the future. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>